Welcome to the Books and Travel Podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Joe Francis Penn, and today I'm talking to Rick Antonson about his journey to the fabled resting place of Noah's Ark, as well as some of the research into biblical history and ancient myths of the flood. The word Ararat brings to mind an adventure into myth and history, and since my own arcane thrillers centre around biblical archaeology, history and myth, this was a particularly exciting interview for me. Plus, it's a trip that most of us would never attempt, since it combines a dangerous area of the world with some pretty strenuous mountain climbing. (laughs) So Rick also talks about the serendipity of travel and how he prepares for the unexpected, but also follows his curiosity. Plus, we talk a little bit about how the pandemic might change travel in the future, although, of course, none of us know how that might pan out. So I hope you enjoy the interview. Rick Antonson is an author, professional speaker and world traveller. Today we're talking about his book, Full Moon Over Noah's Ark, An Odyssey to Mount Ararat and Beyond. Welcome to the show, Rick. Thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so excited. I was just saying before we started recording, this is just a catnip to me. I just love stuff about Noah's Ark and Ararat. So I want to ask you, so why choose Ararat? There are so many biblical archaeology sites around the world. So what drew you to this adventure? You know, each each trip, it seems, has its its own little curious motivation. But I, I find that there, there are levels of them. They, 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 they continue to overlap. So Part of it was as a, a youngster, four or five, nine years old, whatever, I first encountered the, the, the story of Noah's Ark and Mount Ararat. Secondly, there was a book on our shelves. Me and my brother, older brother by a year, shared a bedroom, and we shared a bookshelf. And one of the books there was about a fellow who in the early 50s, a, a Frenchman, had gone to Mount Ararat, actually seeking to find Noah's Ark, believing as he did as a person of faith, that that it actually had landed there. And those two things, along with as time went on and I was older, wanting to go and be places that were uncommon, um, the phrase gets used off the beaten path, but but it, it really was to try and do something that maybe friends and family and others weren't doing. And one day it just I was looking at a map and across my mind came Mount Ararat. <laughs> it, it, it just has a, a romance about it, really. Do you think, because you're uh, in Canada, do you think that people who live, because I and I'm in Europe and, you know, I've traveled in the Middle East. Do you think there is something quite different when you're from the sort of from North America, Canada to come to the Middle East? Well, you know, first of all, the last couple of years, my wife Janice and I were living in in Europe because of my wife's job. And then before that, for five years, uh, she was in Australia and I was back and forth. And then the last couple of years living there. So probably bring a, a, a different perspective. But the further away you are from any destination, the more romantic, perhaps for bidding, foreboding, a, a place could be. And, and the Middle East is so characterized with turmoil that to actually plan on traveling there has to put safety at the front of your mind and also just loads your planning table with with history almost overwhelming history again you know layers of it that one wants to sift through before they go but you also don't want to take away that traveler's awe by being too prepared Absolutely. And you mentioned their overwhelming layers of history, which is certainly true. But what what is history and what is myth when it comes to Ararat and the flood? So the sort of Reader's Digest Peter Rabbit short version is that great flood stories appear throughout 
the world, all over the planet. There have been them, perhaps localized floods, but, but they were great floods to the people involved. So the factual part is that if a flood happened in you know 5000 BC, almost anywhere in the world, if you had never traveled you know, more than, than, than 20 miles from, from Bath in any direction, and you didn't know anyone else who had, and, and, and that part of the world is under flood, then to your knowledge, the world itself has flooded. So, so these localized floods took on a, a, a you know, pan-planet uh, storyline. And so those are, are facts we know. Another fact we know is that when the last ice age was winding down, that the world's oceans, seas all over the planet, rose by 300 meters. I mean, that's huge. And, and so as they rose, I'm sorry, I should say that another way, 300 feet, as they rose, so did the pressure on land bridges or places blocking the, the, the water. And, and they spilled over into other areas, again, causing Niagara Falls like proportions of flooding. So those are things we know and are facts. You then take the story of a survivor of any of those floods, let it go through person to person oral storytelling for 2,000 years before anybody writes it down, it's bound to get a little distorted, but the survivors have the best stories. Some of those flood survivor stories led to literally a raft, if you'll allow me that analogy, a raft of different stories about what we would today call the Noah's Ark story. Mm, and it's interesting, as storytelling people, we have to turn these great disasters into some kind of meaning. So as you mentioned, the flood stories, they generally do talk about some type of God, don't they? Many of the stories. Right. So the God in part comes because that was the belief about what controlled the weather. So if the weather goes really, really bad and somebody needs to be blamed or it's good and somebody needs to be thanked, that brings about sort of the religious overtone. But the gods were different and in some cases plentiful. There would be more than one deity at a, at, at, at a, a time. But also the stories as they emerged about the flood, I mean, they would happen in different times. So the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is the first written down book, if you will, predecessor to, to your own writing, the, the clay tablet, clay tablets, include the, the story of a flood, a, 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 a angry or disappointed God, people feeling that they were being put upon, and then there is a survivor, and the survivor has sort of the moral, moral of the tale. So then, years later, hundreds of years later, uh, the Babylonian flood story becomes and gets written down, some of it oral. And then when the, the, the Jewish people were, were um, banned from their homeland for what was, what, 60 years or so, they perhaps imported that story, brought it back. It gets written down eventually. Noah is the hero of the story. It becomes the sort of Torah, the Old Testament, and the Christian Bible. Yet in the Koran, in sort of 600 AD, a little over 600 AD, there's a flood story, and the hero is Nu. So think of this as capital N U H and a circumflex over the U. So those various versions of the story are what in popular or contemporary society is the story of Noah's Ark. Mm. And it's just incredible that these things are thousands of years old and, and yet pretty much every school kid <laughs> would, would would have these stories, would know about these stories. So I want to ask you about the Ark itself, because, again, talking about children's books, in my head, the children's book is, you know, the sort of the straight sides and the animals going in two by two and the song. And so everyone's got an image of, of an Ark in their head, I think, or you see kids toys, you know, made out of wood and things. But there is actually some really interesting research um, that you mention in the book. So what about the Ark itself? 
So you are absolutely right. If you stopped the next 30 people on the street, if you went out for a walk, social distancing, kept them in, you just said the phrase two by two, <laughs> everybody would say Noah's Ark. Like, like it's, it's not maybe 30% or 80%. It would be 100% of people would make that, that association. So the Ark in the image you just described is how artists began to portray it over the years. And it, it took on a, a, a fun caricature and often it would have the, the, the animal and, and, and their mate there. So there'd be the giraffe, there'd be the elephants, whatever. That, that was sort of the pictorial rendition that became popularized. But in other ancient tablets, and one found by, the, by a, a, an individual, a scholar associated with the British Museum, actually predates the biblical records, written down records, and, and has a god saying, gather some of the food sources and some of the animals and your family and get ready to go away because there's going to be a flood. But that description of how to build the ark is a round ark, not the type you described or what anybody would maybe sketch. It was a round one based on uh, small boats of the time that were, were circular and were very common in sort of the Persian area. So the, the um, probability of someone reading this and saying, ah, yeah, I get that. You can do that is, uh, is fascinating. So there was actually a, a BBC story where they, they used that information and built a third of the full size, but they built a, a, what that, or architectural direction would lead you to do. And it was a floatable raft. So the what the ark may look like could be many, many, many different things, depending on the source of the story. So it's fair to say that versions of the boats we think about as perhaps legend and having myth around them, versions of those could actually have been constructed for whatever purpose. Mm. And I, I watched that and um, this obscure academic, you know, with this big beard, Irving Finkel, <laughs> and, and this, this lovely boat that they made. I think they made it in Kerala in South India because it was they did. yeah cheaper to, to build the materials. And it's just a kind of classic um, experiment. But as you said, they do float it. They, I mean, it doesn't look to me like it would survive what we think of as the flood in our in our heads. But it was certainly really, really fascinating. Well, and, and, and all of a sudden, it becomes a, a, not a probability, but a, but a possibility. I think the other context that's important is that around the time all of this was, was beginning to come together in terms of the story and some of the floods, and there's a specific one that I write about in Full Moon Over Noah's Ark, and that's with the Bosphorus Strait. Along around the same time, peoples in different parts of the world, and certainly there, say around the Black Sea, were beginning to, in their social setup, they, 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 they were becoming less nomadic, some of them, and beginning to harvest crops annually, begin to put down the roots of, of sort of steady homes and maybe clusters of them, so the very earliest indications of, of, of a village setting. And they were on the shores of big water sources, particularly lakes, the fishing and whatever. If there was a flood, then those who were most able to survive would be those who had the family boat, who perhaps were the fishers. And they would, of course, gather family, whatever sort of livestock they, they may have, have had tethered to posts in their yards. And they would have gathered some of their food. So that the story of a family escaping, ending up hundreds of miles blown by wind and rising waters and telling their story of survival is very probable. Does that get exaggerated? Does it become that there were groups of them? Was there, there one great big ship? Of course, that's how storytelling can quite easily uh, evolve. And, and, and where fiction crosses over into the nonfiction, it could well be based on some fact. 
Mm. Well, that's what I really love about your book is that you've got these sort of deep historical um, details and then also it is a tra travel story of your of your own trip. But of course, you can't just hike up Ararat. You can't just go, well, I'm just going to walk it up, up it today. So if people don't know, where is it in terms of the sort of surrounding countries that make it hard to get to? And what were some of the obstacles you had to overcome? Well, two parts to the, the, the answer. One is what it was like for me, and the other is what it would be like today. So the, the, when I did this some, some years ago, it, it, I mean, the mountain is stationary. It's in, in eastern Turkey, and at, it's, it's stationaryism has been distorted over time because for a while it was part of Armenia. And Armenians see this as their signature of nationhood. You, you can see it when you're, you're in, in Yerevan. It's right there. Part of the while it was, you know, the Russian bear had its arms wrapped around it when it controlled Armenia. Uh, there, there are some that say if the Kurdish people ever had their homeland, it should include Mount Ararat. But today it is part of Turkey. It is in eastern Turkey. And one needs a permit to climb on it, which can take a couple of months. And for example, when I was on the mountain, we climbed uh, closely with a, a group of Armenians and they have a fence between Armenia and the mountain. So they have to come through Georgia down. It's a long way for them to get there. So there are the, and, and it's more costly for them simply because they're Armenians and the Armenians and Turkish people have anxiety, which is rooted in, in much, much history. So it was a bit complicated and one needed the patience uh, and a tour operator could help. But in 2014, because of the Kurdish and the, the Turks having their, their, their battles and insurgents and so forth, access to Mount Ararat was banned. And for five years, you were not allowed to go on the mountain. So you couldn't have replicated my trip. As of this time last year, spring of 2019, those restrictions have been eased a bit. And there are now again some uh, tour operators who can facilitate the uh, permission sort of certificate and so forth. And of course, you need a professional guide if you're going to do as I did. I joined a, a group of, of five of us and a guide who, who with the intention of summiting Mount Ararat, which is a 17,000 foot mountain. If you want to do that, you can't just end up on the mountain. You have to be absolutely prepared. It's not a technical mountain climb, but it's a demanding one with some uh, very sheer sides, which one could easily fall over. Yeah, which which is just incredible, really, because uh, as you say, it's difficult politically, it's difficult to physically get there and then get the permits. But then also, uh, as you described, it, it was a mountain climb. So did you do specific training for the physical aspects of the trip? Yes, I, I didn't want to embarrass myself by... <laughs> Finding out partway along that I hadn't taken it seriously in terms of the, 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 the preparation. And I think whenever anyone is going to do something of a physical demanding, whether it's a long semi-level trek or it's something like this, which is, is significant in terms of altitude change, one has to make sure they've, they've broken in their boots. One has to make sure, as I was told, bring an ice axe, be, you know, be prepared, uh, have a sleeping bag that, that can withstand a significant drop in temperature. Be prepared, aside from the foods that they bring with your own safety and a bit of additional food in case, perchance, one got separated. All of those things that that are, are prudent that a mountaineer would, would do for sure, but you know that you're joining a group that may have a couple of people who have climbed on other mountains. They may not have summited a lot. You don't know. Our, our group was pretty qualified, and we'd each been on other summits, and we'd We've done a lot of hiking and, and, and trekking, but still, one has to arrive prepared for your own safety, but also not to jeopardize the safety of those you are, are planning to summit with. Mm. And so what did you find at the top? I mean, let's assume you didn't find Noah's Ark, but did you see your full moon? Well, so it, it, the, the, the back story to that is that when I made arrangements to join this group, and I, there was only one other person at the time, a fellow, a Brit who was actually living in, in, um, 
China, and he had, had committed to going. And so the dates were a bit uncertain. And I happened, this is happenstance, I realized that if we left just a bit, two days earlier, we would be able to be on the top, theoretically, of Mount Ararat under a full moon. So I contacted them and said, could we change the date? They contacted the other fellow. And so our date allowed us to get to the top of Mount Ararat under a full moon. I should explain that when you're doing the summit, you leave at about one o'clock in the morning so that you will get up and be up there for the sun, sunrise, which is, is just awesome. But it means that you are climbing the mountain pretty much in, in, in the dark. So the full moon aspect really intrigued me. And it led to someone saying to me, gee, you would be fortunate. You would, you would see the full moon over Noah's Ark, and which led to the, the, the title of the book. It's interesting because the publisher said, I wanted the title to be Full Moon Over Mount Ararat. And the publisher in New York said, you know, every American knows Noah's Ark, but not every American knows the name Mount Ararat. So that was their shift on the title to be Full Moon Over Noah's Ark. So when we got to the top of Mount Ararat, when you stand there, you're in Turkey and you look down on the country of Armenia and you look down on the country of Iran. And you're not that far really from the country of Iraq, but, but you do stand there and be in one country and look on the other two. And it was fantastic. And when you're at the top, there's a little bit of a, you could call it a saddle. And you literally have that feeling of being on top of the world. It's just incredible. And then after the mountain, so what's great about the book again is that there's this period of the, the climbing and then the book doesn't finish. You go on to Iraq, Iran, Armenia. So tell us, what, what else did you find that added to the story of the Ark? You know, we, we were uh, fortunate. We had a couple of days afterwards. So I, I had asked the guide if he could make arrangements for me to stay in some small village on my own. And he got me into his grandfather's home in a small village off the mountain. And that led to some other stories about their reverence for, for the mountain, which they call Agri Dog, which is, is their, their term for Mount Ararat. They would not call it Mount Ararat. And so this village was in the, 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 the sort of foothills, if you will, of the mountain and I saw it at night. I saw it when I woke up in the morning. There wasn't a lot of English spoken, but their sense was that they lived in the shadow, if you will, of historically the most important, certainly most renowned, most legendary mountain in the world. And, and that was their sense of, of place. So that was, was important. The other thing was that, or another thing, was that myself and the guide and a couple of the others I uh, summited with went to see a place that often gets written about in everything from National Geographic to in its day Life magazine, which is a uh, it's away from the mountain, but it it's a, a rock structure that at first, even second or third glance, you're convinced looks like it's dirt covering over a sunken ark. It just looks like that image of the ark that you you described. <laughs> yeah. And we, we went there. It, it is a rock formation. They've done lots of, of speculative research, scientific research, and then ground soundings and so forth. It's a rock structure. But visually, it has added immensely to the legend of what if. And, and it, there have been charlatans and lots of other people that have distorted the facts, distorted the science, and tried to portray this as... A, as the landing place of, of Noah's Ark. So that, that just um, enhanced my story, enhanced my understanding about how many people have exaggerated or played off this for fundraising and done all sorts of things because the legend, if we could call it that, uh, exists and it's there and some people manipulate it. And, but that was all within Eastern Turkey. That was before I went to, to Iraq. Mm. But then you visited a particular clay tablet, didn't you? I didn't write that down, but... Well, I, when I was in Iran, I ended up at a, a museum where they had on loan from the British Museum, and there it was, what is called the Flood Tablet. Uh, and this relates to the Epic of, of uh, Gilgamesh. 
And, and, and so that was fantastic. You, you, you find these different things that happen to, to be there. And it is just serendipity when you can come across something like that. And, and, but when I was in, in Iraq, I, I did get out close to, to the mountain that in, in the Koran is where their story of Nuz Ark landed. And, and that added again to, to my understanding so that the narrative thread in, in the book is, of course, the, the, the traveling I did, arriving in Turkey, making my way to Mount Ararat, joining the expedition of Dagobi Azit, summiting, coming off of it, ending up in Iraq, back into Turkey, on a train to Iran, and then later to Armenia. But when I flew out of Iran, I flew, uh, at the end of that journey, I flew uh, to, to London and met with some people at the, the British Museum to, again, further my understanding and my research and ended up with more books to read. And and there I saw the flood tablet it's, it's, itself. I mean, it was just amazing. And, and I think that that good travels for a writer require a, a, a fair dose of serendipity. Oh, I totally agree. <laughs> it's so funny when I write uh, thrillers, but I always I'm like, oh, I wish that was true, and then I would go, I'll go somewhere, and I'll find out it was true or something ah, did yes. happen. You know, like a person was there at that time that could make my story actually real. And what you've talked about there is, you know, uh, uh, world religions have this story, but is shaped by the physical landscape, it's shaped by the climate, uh, and shaped by belief. So uh, it's just just fascinating well and and sometimes the the religious needs of a particular group skew a story for self-serving regions I and mean, we know this by I mean, in the analysis is done about you know say the the, the books of a bible or, or the books of of um, the, the writings within the quran or other other religions there's there's long been a a uh, sort of the the, the editorial hand of mostly mostly guys which which you know doesn't always do the woman's side of the story very well they don't let it through in the telling but the long arc of history again using that more as an arch that that narrative is so varied depending on where in the world you're encountering it but regardless of, of whether it's something like was there a localized flood that that dominated everyone's thinking and, and, and has a, a legacy of the storytelling, or if you're just encountering their, their uh, stories about beliefs, because the belief mechanism is a profound part of society around the world. You know, there have been like 4,500 go gods throughout history, and, and, you know, people today discount 4,490 of them, but the other 10 are an act of dispute, arguments, and discussion. Indeed. Uh, and so, of course, you mentioned Iraq and Iran, and many people will avoid those places. They're not usually on people's travel lists. And your most recent book, Walking with Ghosts in Papua New Guinea, is also set in a country considered pretty dangerous. I lived in Australia and New Zealand, and, and PNG was sort of, you know, somewhere where you had to prepare a lot to go to. So what, what is it about um, your personality that makes you seek out these difficult places? And, and what does the sense of danger bring to your travels you know I, I have two sons who have done a lot of traveling and I have, I've traveled with them in fact the the three of us have over five trips ended up circumnavigating the northern hemisphere by train and so we've ended up in places like Belarus or, or North Korea and and there is something that that heightens your senses your your awareness if you're traveling with others your commitment to one another not just counting the bags so you don't leave something behind, but, but you know, watching out for one another. But I've, I've often said to them that, you know, when you're traveling, keep one eye on the horizon and the other looking over your back. And I think if you've got that mindset, you're prepared for the unexpected, you don't end up getting to all the places that others would say, oh, you must see, you must do this, or gosh, no traveler would go there without doing this but you end up encountering the people. And as a writer, you know, those are the shadows where the best stories are tucked away. 
they come from from the individuals who maybe take you into their home or or help you out of a, a sketchy situation. When I was trekking the Kokoda Trail in Papua New Guinea, again, it was a spontaneous, but I, I didn't even know about it until a, a, a neighbor, when Janice and I were living in Australia, a neighbor said he was going to do it. And so we ended up, again, securing the proper um, the tour guide and, and set up and porters and all of that stuff so that one could be safe in a, a somewhat at times unsafe set of circumstances so that there is a definite draw that that um, doesn't let you go to sleep right away at night because you're thinking about safety even if you're bone tired from trekking and when you wake up in the middle of the night you've got a little bit of a second hesitation in your breath because you realize you're in the pitch dark in a place that that has whether it's wild animals or, or uh, circumstances where people aren't always hospitable but we had an amazing time in Papua New Guinea the Kokoda Trail was a pivotal battle in World War II but the people living in Europe and people living in North America it was war at the end of the world to Australians, as you would know, it was war on their doorstep. Mm. I mean, the the difference in weather between Ararat climbing and Papua New Guinea must have been crazy. Because it, it just explain like like the the landscape of of PNG. So in 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 Papua New Guinea, it is always about to rain, and and you you can feel that in in the air. And they sometimes have torrential rains. We didn't encounter I've, I've had torrential rains on other travels but we didn't encounter it on our our trek the portion of which is so demanding up down up down up 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 and then down 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 in the 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 uh, stanley mountains but but what took us six days i've talked to others it took them 10 days or 11 days because of the rain and it just turns the ground to 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 muck and sucks your boots off. So, so that is, is part of it. The other is that if you visit sites of war, whether it's in America, you go to civil war sites that have all been curated and fancied up and the lawns get mowed, or you go to battle sites in Europe or elsewhere where they've been, you know, freshened and, and, and they're, they're somewhat historically polished for today's visitors. In, in PNG, we, we trekked where the Australians and the Japanese fought, and a lot of it by bayonet, a lot of it face-to-face, -face, a lot of it the, just a horrible reminder that war has, has you know, no winners. Everybody loses. Yes, there's a victor, but everybody's a victim. Uh, and and it, was, it was terrible there. MacArthur called it the worst fighting conditions anywhere in World War II. So when you're trekking there today, you're, you're walking through sites that are as they were then. They've not been fancied up. You've got, you know, 17 shades of green. The jungle is there as the jungle was then. And you can still see pits that were carved for people to do their fighting out of, whether they were the aggressor or the defender at different times on the track. So there is an alarming sense of angst and just the horribleness of it all. It's very real and, and, and you know, inches away from you when you crawl into one of the, 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 the little fighting pits, you're there. And that, that was upsetting. Hmm. And, and I, I, I was just wondering then, do you ever just go to the beach, Rick? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, Janice and I yeah, have been together for like 30 years, but the last dozen, she's had some really interesting postings around the world. And, and uh, she's in the aviation uh, field. And, and at the time we were, we were in Australia, she was general manager with the, 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 the Cairns Airport, but she's had these other posting so before I, I left where I was was working full-time so that we could get back to living together in Australia and then in Europe we would always meet up somewhere in the world once a month that was our, our commitment during those years and often we would meet in a place that was just comfortable that you didn't have to think about anything and so we did have some of those descriptions that you've uh, that you've spoken about but but our penchant 
is is to get to some other other places. And so Janice and I had the the opportunity once um, to go from Lhasa in Tibet you know, over the Himalayas uh, in a four by four with a driver guide, making our way to Kathmandu. And and she's game. She's game for for stuff like that. But there are times that that you you want to have a, a little stockpile of of books and and not have to think about preparing your own meals. So I, I fully respect that type of, of travel is what many people want to do. I just hope they take along one of your books or one of mine. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, no, I, I'm not really a beach person either, but it's just, it's, uh, it, it is nice sometimes to, to just, as you say, have someone cook for you or something. But I, I do, as we talk now, um, the world is under the coronavirus pandemic and we can't even, like, I can't even go and visit my mum, you know, who lives in the next town, let alone leave the country. So I wondered, like... It, are you reflecting on what travel means to you and, and what does travel bring to your life and to your creative side and your writing? Well, I don't think any of us will ever again take for granted the right to assemble. And you know, I, I come out of the destination marketing world for Vancouver in, in Canada and we you know, hosted the Olympics and we have an amazing convention center and the hotels, many of them today are, are closed. And one wonders what the world of meetings and conventions, conferences will look like in, in the, the, the coming few years. So you, you think about that, you know, the tourism industry was one of the first to be wound down because of the, the, the pandemic. And and will be one of the last to sort of get back on on sturdy legs. And, and I don't think we will see a consumer confidence in, in the world of travel and a tourism industry internationally of what 2019 looked like. I don't think we're going to see that till perhaps 2003. So what it does do is make people ask, how does that recovery look for travel? Uh, what will it be like when you get on an airplane and you're issued masks, which not everybody will wear? So how do you make sure that somebody polices that and gets everybody to wear them? How were airplane prices going to be affected if they're only if they're leaving the middle seats empty? What happens when you arrive in a country and they ask you to self-quarantine for a bit? You're certainly not going to go there for a short journey, and you would only go if you're going to see family and friends and, and have an extended a multi-week visit to make the, the self-quarantine worthwhile. And all of that is, is, the coming, is the coming 12 months for sure. And so I, I, I wonder about that, wonder where one will be able to get to. You know, Turkish Airlines have, have pretty much suspended their there are you know, a lot of their domestic flights, so if, and, and same thing with some of the, 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 the trains. So if you wanted to get, say, to eastern Turkey right now, if you could go on Mount Ararat, what would that look like? How would you, how would you get there? What's the affordability compared to when, when a lot of people were using those airplanes, if only fewer are? So I, I think all of those dynamics are unfortunately um, going to be with all those of us who wish to travel, whether it's to a beach resort or it's on something much more adventuresome, uh, we will be hampered in terms of access and affordability and a willingness of others to, to be, be in, in close quarters. Mm. And do you have somewhere in mind that you're, you're planning for, for once things do get back to whatever the new normal looks like? Well, um, about four years ago, uh, Buddy and, and I met up in Chicago and we took the train they call the city of New Orleans and we went to a New Orleans having Halloween um, night in New Orleans. And then we got in a, a rented vehicle and we had a week and, and we just chased really good music and really good food and traveled places, Louisiana, Mississippi, um, Arkansas, that neither of us had, had ever been to. We have a, a, another trip that we would like to do, a road trip uh, into the States, just the two of us around Kentucky and so forth, this fall. We planned it for late October. I don't know. Will we be able to, to do that? And, and, and if, we, if we do, that, that would be wonderful. 
I also would would like to hike the Chilkoot Trail, which starts in Alaska and then ends in Yukon in Canada. It was it was made prominent, famous around the the 1898 gold rush, the Yukon gold rush, the Alaska gold rush, and and the, the movie Call of the Wild is out now, and, and there's a, actually a scene of the people going up this. It's a very demanding, very straight, but short duration in terms of, 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 of a couple of days rather than a longer trek. I'd love to I, I'd love to do that. It's it's something that I've I've long wanted to. So those are are are, are a couple of a couple of them for sure. Well, one thing we can do now, of course, is escape through books. <laughs> and yes, a, apart yes. from your own books, can you recommend a couple of others that you love in terms of your favourites or anything specifically about the areas we've talked about? Well, you know, a travel book that influenced me as a traveller, but also as a reader of travel books, is Bruce Chatwin's In Patagonia. And it's it's a... I think a remarkable tale written by a traveler who at the time, I, I think it may have been his first book, though he he was you know an ingrained part of of, of, of UK society and, and wrote articles and so forth. But but in Patagonia by Bruce Chatwin, I would say, uh, along with his the song lines uh, set in Australia are are two books on the travel side. Wade Davis wrote a book called Into the Silence, came out just a few years ago. Uh, and it's about George Mallory and, and the quest to Mount Everest, but also very much about the uh, British society expeditions and so forth coming out of, of, of the World War and what that that meant, and then leading to expeditions and, and the summit. So that Into the Silence by Wade Davis, I think, is a pretty important book. But the book I'm reading right now, driven by current circumstances is called The Great Influenza. And it's the story of the 1918 pandemic. It's a book that came out in 2004, written by John M. Barry, B-A-R-R-Y. And he did a, a new afterword for an edition that came out on the 100th anniversary. So just a couple of years ago, it came out in, in 2018. And reading it is at once educational, and at the same time, horrifying how, how even with, with hundreds of thousands of incidents of the disease in, in you know, the sort of late July, early August period in, in 1918, British medical journals and, and French medical journals declared the epidemic kind of over. And as Barry writes, he said, and they declared it, by the way, as also of a mild version. It, the way he writes about that is that it was like a forest fire, and and it can appear to be out, but it's spreading through its roots. It's spreading underground, and then pops up in an amazing flame miles away from what people thought was the locale. And of course, it did within weeks begin to pop up and was a, a more adaptive mutated uh, virus and went on to, to kill uh, an estimated 50 to 100 million people around the world. So that's, I think, uh, a, a, an important read, but I would also add that, that if you're in to fiction, if someone was listening to this thinking, well, it's the world's about more than than these nonfiction works, and, and you've got some, some amazing, amazing um, writing and I, I would put your books uh, which I'm going to, to seek out on um, a, a list with I, I like Peter May he, he's got the the you know the like the black house and and he's got just some some amazing books in, in called the Lewis books there's three of them set in Scotland and Philip Kerr who's written like Prussian blue and and some other books so I, if one is into uh, sort of the, the the drama of unfolding murders and and solving them. Then then those are two authors, uh, Philip Kerr and and Peter May that I I uh, thoroughly enjoy. Oh great! Well, the, lots of varied uh, books there. That's brilliant. So where can people find you and your books online? Well, my I'm in the, the books. Thankfully, uh, Skyros Publisher in New York is distributed by Simon and Schuster internationally so that that makes the books 
uh, available, whether they're in a bookstore or, or have to be sought online or in these days seeking them online. And Amazon's been a, a nice supporter. So internationally, that's there. My, my, my website is uh, Rick Antonson. Dot com and that's r i c k a n t o n s o n dot com rickantonson dot com. I also when I speak, uh, I mean, I've had many opportunities, literally from Berlin to Bogota in recent years, to talk about the notion of of the long range, which I think is is applicable now as people are wondering about what to do in the short term, but kind of keeping up nod to the longer term. I often talk about a concept of cathedral thinking, which is really long term. There's a website for that, which is uh, www.cathedralthinking.com. And and so some of my presentations are are on there, along with those from anyone else, like the, the activist Greta Thunberg has, has talked about the need for the European Union and, and British governments to and other governments to use cathedral thinking to solve climate change issues with a view to the long term. So those are our, our two, uh, two sites. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for your time, Rick. That was great. Joe, I thank you. I, I would like to have been the one asking the questions for part of the interview because, you know, looking at what you've done, you've traveled all over, you've done so many fascinating things, and you're a, a storyteller with so many published books. So I, I admire what uh, you have done, and it's, it's an honor to have been able to participate with this. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Happy travels until next time.